No one under 16 will be admitted unless accompanied by a parent or guardian. Only you can judge if your children are mature and intelligent enough to witness the frank and revealing scenes in this film. This is a world of hidden mics and two-way mirrors. A world where nothing is private. I've got some paperwork hand-delivered to me. Harry Call is an expert. The best there is. Is that about this? Your dad's at work today. Let me tell you something about Harry Call. The best bar none. I'll drink to that. The best what? The best bugger on the West Coast. Excuse me, Mrs. Addison? Hey, you doing? I just want to give you this. Listen. You. <laughs> scared. No, don't be scared. He can bug anybody, anytime, anywhere. Do you know that? Is it involved? No, 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 no. Nobody knows how you did it, though, Harry. It was the hell of a scandal, too. Confirm within the last two hours, Charlie Adelson's trial for murdering this man, FSU law professor Dan Markell, will now start on October 23rd. Does it involve me or other people? Well, probably the two of us. They're not people to him, just voices. He doesn't know them, and they don't know him. You probably have a general idea what I'm talking about. Uh, it had nothing to do with me. I mean, I just turned in the tapes. Who is the paperwork sent from? So, um, something that came hand to hand to me as I exited the building today. If someone's messing with you, they're messing with me. If someone's messing with me, they're messing with you. Call them, find out who the fuck it is now. Trust me on this. Let me tell you something. I was at Broward with Dato, and he told me the whole story. Be careful, Harry. Take it through. Find out who the fuck it is. That's all I'm asking you. You have to talk to, but it's, it needs to be nipped in the bud. You're an idiot. You gave a fucking wrong number. Get the fucking number the fucking call because I'm going to call them. That's okay. Okay. I'm going to fucking go to the cops right now. Okay. Well, either you go to the cops or we go to the cops or exactly. we'll find out. What a stupid conversation. Stan, please. I'm trying to work. Call them. Find out who the fuck it is now. Trust me on this. I said, let me call you back later. What the hell are they talking about, for Christ's sake? Stanley, please. I'm trying to get this done. Don't get excited. Well, I'm getting fed up. What's the matter, Harry? If there's one surefire rule that I have learned in this business is that I don't know anything about human nature. I don't know anything about curiosity. I don't, that's not part of what I do. There is nothing private about the conversation. Listen. Whatever it is, I'll, t I'll take mm -hmm. a look at the paperwork. That would be great. Perfect. All right. I'll talk to you later. Love you, honey. Bye. Love you. Bye. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. How is everyone doing? Happy Saturday. That was, of course, from my favorite YouTube channel, or one of them, the Society page. Once again, I can't get enough of it. How often do you have a trailer, a trailer perfect <laughs> for your true crime style podcast? Not often, highly, highly recommend you subscribe to their channel. So today I'm going to talk about and listen to, and we're going to watch together, Charlie Adelson's testimony on the stand, his 95. That's what Dan Rashbaum gave him, his lawyer, out of 100. He rated this testimony 
a 95 out of 100. And it's quite interesting looking back on it. Little bit looks kind of benign on the surface, but given that the first answer, were you responsible at all for the death of Dan Mark, of Professor Dan Markell? And Charlie Adelson answers, absolutely no. <laughs> absolutely no. So already a little bit of a contradiction. I wonder if the jurors were furiously writing in their notebooks at that point. But before we look at that, I have a few things to show you. For one, I want to give a big shout out to Steph, Sell Stuff by the Seashore for sending me a picture of... Wendy Adelson's iconic sleeveless hourglass gray sheath dress from Club Monaco. Apparently, Judy from AA Legal Focus did have this dress and gave it away, unfortunately. But if you watch Judy, you know that she is always on point with her full imitations with costumes of the characters in this true crime case. So thank you very much, Steph, for that. Also want to give a big shout out to Matt Snyder, Schneider, excuse me, for just being a super mensch and sending me some legal documents in this case that I couldn't find. So thank you very much. And I want to get into your comments. From last episode, we were talking about Wendy Adelson and her getting demolished in a cross in Katie McManawa's trial. Dave PP330 says, I have to credit the cross of Wendy. At the end, he had Wendy sucking down water like Katie did when she testified. When you lie and are stressed, your body gives away like physiological needs. Suddenly your mouth goes bone dry. I agree. Georgia has in very subtle ways made it clear to Wendy that she will be charged and tried for Dan's murder, solicitation, and conspiracy. Wendy knows this, and she's making sure she has an attorney that will blame, excuse me, any prosecution on her testimony, which she knows she has immunity from. Her dress, where it's made, try a Florida convent. She's trying to look so innocent. If she tried, I'm sure she'll wear that dress every day. Of course, as she testified, she didn't financially benefit from Dan's murder, which is a blatant lie. She wants the jury to think she doesn't have much money, thus the same dress every time. Interesting. Theory there, David PP three three zero. Great comment. I'm sorry, there's like a glare on my computer. Katarina Harrington says, "Attorney, <laughs> your name is Wendy, right? Wendy, I'm sorry. Is that a question?" Is your question what my first name is exactly? And people were just <laughs> going off on that. Um, you can, you can, what, can you rephrase that, please? I don't understand the question. Are you asking me what my name is? That's exactly Wendy's testimony. The majority of it <laughs> in a nutshell. And 
at 26162 says, in regard to the kosher foods expected to be served in the wedding reception guests, yes, you can describe it as you have a big challenge and disrespect to Dan Markell and kosher guests. I don't know what, okay, hold on. Uh, the other aspect is the cheap Adel Adelsons were apparently unwilling to pay the cost associated with the kosher foods and the food kitchen cleansed for the preparation and storage serving that is required to adhere to kosher law. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Everyone would see that as the Adelsons inviting guests to a wedding reception that might well be compared to asking guests between the church ceremony and while on the drive to the reception to hit a drive through and order fast food for themselves from a burger joint, a bring your own greasy bag fast food wedding reception. Who said the Adelsons were a class A family? Respectful? They're as low rent, they're a, excuse me, they're a low rent disrespectful crew. Unbelievable. So thank you very much. I think it um, so spot on comment. I don't know. They seem to, I don't know if I agree that it was about money. I think it was a challenge right from the get go. Oh, I think you're agreeing with me, but yeah, you're right. It probably would have been more expensive. Kosher food. You also often have to have two sinks, different plates, but in Miami, there is no shortage of Jewish people, and this would not be an unusual request, certainly. Oh, thank you so much. It's Miss Lisa for the super chat. Regard regarding Wendy's, I don't know about Cars Caper on the stand. Could it be linked to the fact that L and S, uh, Luis and Sigfredo, so Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia, hired similar cars to Jeffrey Lacoste. Don't know cars, can't be me. Yeah, that is su such a smart comment, Miss Lisa. Thank you so much. I never thought of that. I mean, this what makes it so gratifying to cover this case. And all the minutia <laughs> is that the audience is so smart and has so many insights. Sherry Davis, Donna impression, please. You want me to do my Donna? My Donna impression? Sherry, it's a little early for Donna. Donna's in the clink. <laughs> she can't be found. She can't come to the phone right now. Yeah, I think we'll probably be seeing a lot of Donna as we go through Charlie Adelson's testimony as some of it is really, if you're not paying attention, can seem really quite boring. But if you listen to the answers, I'll show you. It gets, it gets pretty revealing and pretty interesting. And of course, his blinks are, are right there, his weird blinking. So thank you so much, Sherry Davis. I appreciate it. I'm sure you're driving the people that hate the Donna impression crazy. There are plenty of haters out there for that. Missy Brasovich, thank you so much for the very generous super chat. Roberta the Great, oh, thank you. Thanks for your smart, hilarious commentary. I'm obsessed with this case and your coverage is the best. Thank you so much. Well, that is a warm way to start off the episode. Let's get into it, shall we? It's ready to call its next witness. 
I mean, why even bother taking the oath <laughs> when you know he's going to lie so much? It's just a performative thing that these Adelson family members do at this point. We don't expect them to honor it at all if you've been watching this case. Charlie, let's start with the most important question. Did you cause the death of Professor Dan Markell? Absolutely no. Did you hire anyone to kill him? No. So this is a very interesting. The, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Peter Hyatt's work. There's also other great statement anal analysts out there. But the idea of statement analysis is that your mind goes through and picks out words faster than you can really process what you're saying. And this would be a perfect example. Absolutely. So that's a, something we know as an affirmative. And then followed by a negative, already you have a contradiction and tension in his answers. All right, let's let's get into it. Did you put any letters in any diaper bags of Katie Magbanawa to have Professor Markell killed? No. Uh, before we get there, let's spend some time on your background. How old are you? I'm 47 years old. Where were you raised? So just to two short comments and I, I will let this run, but Rashi seems, so I'm talking about when I say Dan Rashbaum, I call him Rashi because I want to distinguish him from the victim, Dan Markell in this case. So I don't want to have him confused. He looks more nervous than Charlie Adelson. He looks like he's going to faint. No wonder he couldn't rate the performance. He was about to... <laughs> faint throw up it looks like he looks very uncomfortable here and he's never tried a murder trial he hasn't done something like this with these high stakes before and he looks like he, he's gonna throw up or faint or or maybe just maybe just run out of the room in terror and then you have Charlie up there asking Charlie questions about a diaper bag, which he can say no to. Do you think Charlie paid attention to what kind of bag it was? And not for nothing, but how disgusting is it that it's a diaper bag, something associated with your child and children? You're, you're robbing a father, you're robbing children, excuse me, of their father in this murder, and there's the money, all this corruption. Reminds me of the scene in Goodfellas where Henry Hill hands his wife Karen a pile of cash right, right in front of the Christmas tree at Christmas and you know it's blood money. Very much similar to that. So he can answer affirmatively. You think he noticed it was a diaper bag that he was putting it into? Just I was raised in Coral Springs, Florida. When were you arrested in this case? I was arrested April 21st, 2022. And by the way, are you, are you, how do you feel right now? I'm really nervous. Why are you nervous? My, my whole life depends on it. I thought that was a terrible answer. If you are innocent, you can be nervous. Sure, you'll be nervous. But wouldn't your answer be, because I'm being watched worldwide, this is being broadcast? If your whole life depends on it, that gives the idea that your life depends on the answers you're giving and that you may give the wrong answer. And if you're innocent, all you have to do, if you didn't have anything to do with the murder of Dan Markell, that's what I mean by innocence. I mean, this idea of innocence is often thrown around, but that's what I'm talking about. If you had nothing to do with the conspiracy to murder Dan Markell, you would just say, go up there and tell the truth. There would be nothing to 
base your whole life on. And you would have plenty of other witnesses who could back you up. You wouldn't be the only witness up there. So he already knows what he has to do is the impossible. And both of them have practiced and practiced for this. Where have you been living since you were arrested a year and a half ago? Beyond County Jail. Growing up, what was your family like? It was pretty normal. Um, I was the middle of three children. Um, my dad was a dentist. My mom was a school teacher. Um, played a lot of sports. Pretty normal upbringing. Do you have a brother and a sister? I have an older brother and a younger sister. How close were you with your siblings growing up? Um, my brother, I wasn't real close with. My sister, I wasn't really that close with either, probably until I got into high school. And then we were probably closer in age and had more in common. Um, and then I got closer to her as the years went on. Your family growing up, would you describe it how would you describe it financially? Um, I'd say it was upper middle class. And then in 92, my dad lost a lot of money. And then uh, wasn't upper middle class after that. And then my, my dad worked hard and he worked until he was 78. He retired. Where did you go to high school? Uh, I went to public school in Coral Springs. I attended Terravella High School. Was school easy for you? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I had to work really hard to, to get good grades and I really didn't get good grades until I went to college. Where did you go to college? I went to uh, UCF in Orlando. And after graduating from college. Did you see that? So Charlie is almost mouthing the words before he can get it out. So he knows the questions and he probably knows them in order of which they're going to be asked. Look at that. Look at it again. He starts mouthing the words before. That's what I thought he was doing. You take a, take a look and, and see what you see right here. Where did you go to college? I went to uh, UCF in Orlando. Did you see that? It was so weird. Let me go back one more time. Such a weird little moment. Easy for you. Uh, not really. I mean, I, I had to work really hard to, to get good grades and I really didn't get good grades until I went to college. Where did you go to college? I went to uh, UCF in Orlando. And after graduating from college, what did you do next? Actually, now in hindsight, that might just be dry mouth. You might be getting the same kind of windy dry mouth that we're seeing. I don't know. At first in my eye, it really looked like he was mouthing mouthing the words to what college he, or university he went to. Next. Uh, I went to dental school. Where did you go to dental school? Uh, I went to dental school at Nova Southeastern in Fort Lauderdale. After dental school, what did you do? I did a residency in periodontics, and I did that at Nova Southeastern also. Briefly, what is periodontics? Periodontics is the surgery of the gums and bone, and it's uh, three more years after dental school. During your residency, did you work? I did. I'd, I'd moonlight and I'd work nights and weekends as a general dentist. When your residency ended, what was your financial situation? I had uh, about $200,000 in student loans. Now, after graduating from your residency, what did you decide you were going to do? So do you get what this is about? This is all about Charlie not being a spoiled rich kid. That's what this is all about, how hard he works. And that, I believe, was from the mind of Donna. Donna thought up the idea you were working too hard. You were working too hard, Charlie. <laughs> too many hours working too, too many hours to have time to conspire to murder Dan Markell. That's one of the ideas behind their defense. I believe it started with Wendy at the police station with how many hours her brother works, and it's just gone all through this case. Um, 
I started basically moonlighting when I was in dental school. And then when I got out, I really didn't have money to start a, start a business. So I started working for just individual dentists where I'd come in and do the surgery for them in, uh, in house. So they wouldn't have to send the work out, but the patients could still be seen by a specialist. So I'd travel from office to office. When you started, and I think, when did you graduate your residency? Graduated my residency in 2006. When you started, how many offices did you travel to? When I first started, it was just the first office, the first office that I was moonlighting in when I was in my residency. And then through an assistant that worked there, she introduced me to a couple offices and then those offices introduced me to more people. And it just, it grew from there. By the end of the first year, I was probably working in, I would say six or eight offices. By the time frame of 2014, when Professor Markell was murdered, how many offices were you working in approximately? Uh, between 30 and 35 offices I would come in to. When you graduated, where did you live? When I graduated, uh, when I graduated Perio, I lived in an apartment across the street from school. And then I, I bought my house. I, I still lived in 16 years or 20 years later uh, after that. And that house is where? On Whale Harbor. I, I moved in there in 2006. Now, during this time frame of 2014, um, can you describe for the jury how far you would travel? In other words, how far were the offices apart from one another? I, I never turned any work down. So I had an office as far south as Cutler Ridge, which is a little bit north of Homestead. Uh, it's a good hour and a half south of Fort Lauderdale. And then my furthest office I went to north was in East Port St. Lucie, which is a good hour, hour and 45 minutes north of Fort Lauderdale. Port St. Lucie is probably about halfway between Miami and Orlando. Is that fair to say, or closer to Orlando? I'd say it's probably closer to Orlando. Okay. Yeah. Now, your typical work week, what did it look like? I would work in usually two offices a day. I would start around eight or nine o'clock, work in one office till about one o'clock, and then I'd go to another office and I'd piggyback it. I tried to be in another office that was in the same vicinity as the first office. And I usually start there at around 1.30. I'd have it where it's only a five or 10 minute drive to the second office. I, I would tell them I could stay as late as you need. And then when people had emergencies, which when you work in 30 offices, there's always someone that has an issue. Um, I would come into their office. I would just say, just have an assistant stay. And when I got done with that second office, if it was eight o'clock, 8.30, I I would still go in and I'd work in the third office. So it was almost two offices on most days. And I would say 20% and 30% of the time there was a third office. How many days a week did you work? And again, we're talking about the 2014 time, time frame. I was working six days a week. And I, yeah, then I was still working six days a week. Now, some, sometimes I'd, every once in a while there'd be a big case and my whole week was booked up. And the patient needed something and it was hours and I didn't have time. So an office would open up on Sunday and I would go in on Sunday and do the work. For the most part in your job working in these offices, what form of payment were you paid mostly in? Was it cash or some other form of payment? It, the offices would always pay me an in office check. Now, were you ever paid in cash from these offices? I wasn't paid from the, the offices that I worked for in cash, but if I was doing a, a work on like one of the assistants in the office or a friend of the dentist and the dentist didn't want any money to come to him and I was doing it as a favor, I would say, just go ahead and pay me in cash for the materials. And then the assist and the materials were expensive. Sometimes they were hundreds, sometimes it was a thousand dollars. And then if I was, but the dentist didn't want to take any of the money from that person. So he was like, I'm removing myself from the situation. So the person would pay me the cash for the, just for the materials for the work that I did on them. And that was really just when I was doing favors and it wasn't a, it was sporadic. Sometimes more than other, depends on the month. So that's how he got a whole 
safe full of cash doing dental work for Dennis? Is that what we're supposed to think from that? Is that the point of it? Did I miss the point? Help me. Did I just miss the point? Is he saying that he so often did dental work for other dentists that he was paid not only for the dental work, but for the price of the materials in cash. And the inference is that he's supposed to have a whole pile full of cash in his safe. Is that? Let me know. Let me know what you guys think. By the way, backtracking a little bit, growing up, what profession was your dad in? My, my dad was a general dentist. And what was, did your mom work growing up when you grew up? She was, when she, she had three kids and uh, she still worked as a substitute teacher where she, uh, she would come in sporadically, but she wasn't working full time after, uh, after she had the three of us. Did there come a time where she worked in your dad's dental practice? Yeah, I would say probably after the kids went to college um, or maybe probably towards the end of high school, college, my mom came in and was, and was doing front desk work and helping my dad out. And uh, what other roles did she have in the office? Um, she did the bookkeeping. She helped me with all my financial stuff as far as like paying insurances making stuff with anything that was due at a certain time, licenses. Um, she paid salaries at the office and then also did front desk with. Right. Writing fake checks, fake employment checks to Katie McBanawa, planning murders on her off hours. She was an integral part of the office. So you can sort of see here how he could be seen as hardworking if you didn't know anything. If you heard nothing but this testimony, you might think that he had nothing to do with this. But in light of all the other evidence and where the cross is going and how arrogant he, he becomes on cross, if you're going to quote me, date me, anyone remember that? You want to know what when I said that? That was tape number April 22nd, 2015. That's when I said, whenever it was. <laughs> he looked like an arrogant ass, but really interesting thing. I want to show you just actually, maybe I'll wait for some heavy blinking. Because I want to show you um, interesting comparison. With Erica. All right. Um, let's talk about the Adelson Institute. <clears throat> when you became this traveling periodontist. Uh, right on cue. Thank you, Charlie. Right on cue. We have some heavy blinking. So, you know, he does the, that weird heavy blinking. We saw him sitting at the defense table doing that same heavy winking, blinking. It's almost like winking. Very long, erratic blinking, intense blinking. Yeah, it's like erratic in time is what I'm talking about. It doesn't have a constant time. It's this odd blinking. Check this out. So I just wanted to show you really quickly. This is from Robert Durr's trial. Check this out. Kathy got to the city. They were going to look for Kathy. Kathy did get to the city. She didn't jump off the train. But in the course of telling the story to the police, making a decision to tell them what uh, the Germans call a Blitzluger, which is like, you know, convenient, quick lie. Um, uh, did you, do you remember a feeling of I'm definitely lying to the police. I'd like to get this over with and be back home. Or what, how do you yeah, that's 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 exactly, exactly it. I'm going to tell the police I saw a bill that was mayor. That will put me back at the house. I'll tell them I went out for a walk and called her. I will confirm.
confirmed that she was in the city, and that would be the end of it. And she did go to the city. Did you uh, did you end up speaking to her that night? No. So there was a lot of discussion about this phone call. Yeah. Well, what were you, give me. A so there's a little of his intense, intense, intense blinking. You can really see it here in this part. Telling the story to the police, making a decision to tell them what uh, the Germans. Call. Yeah, you saw it. <laughs> you saw it. So it's exactly like what I said. Just intense blinking, that same weird blinking. What is up with that? What does that mean? I, is it, I guess it's just a nervous tick that both of them have. Odd, right? Okay, back to Charlie. It was one of the, were one of the places that you traveled to uh, your dad's dental practice. Yes. How often uh, did you work at the, at, the, at the Adelson Institute? I would work at my dad's office, uh, I would say every four to six weeks. Um, and I would piggyback it. There was another office that I worked at every two weeks that was in the same plaza as my dad's. So I would finish there usually about four o'clock and then I'd go into my office and then I'd start working there by 4.15 and I'd stay as late as I needed to, I mean, 10, 11 o'clock. Do you remember what the full name of the practice was called? Well, originally, or when we changed it to it? Well, let's start with what you changed it to. Okay, well, when I graduated, uh, my residency in periodontics, I thought since I was joining my dad's practice and it was now going to have a periodontist there, I thought we'd rename the practice and, and give it a fancy name. So I, I, we called it the, uh, we copyrighted the Adelson Institute for Implants and Aesthetic Dentistry. Okay. Now growing up. And it was a wonderful name, Charlie. We had a whole cake made up with a whole building. And we had a ribbon and we renamed it the Adelson Institute. It was a wonderful day. That was the clumped. <laughs> the Adelson Institute. Charlie Adelson and his father, Harvey. Harvey. <laughs> doing dental work, the Adelson Institute. Like they're doing important work studying dentistry there and i'm being corrected that he was doing free work for dentists and was just being paid for the materials and that was what the huge money piles of money in his safe were from okay thank you for the correction guys did it have that name no it was just a plain old dental practice right yeah it was just my my dad and his three employees how many people worked at the Adelson Institute? Uh, there was Erica Johnson, uh, Clarissa. Erica was the front desk. Clarissa was my dad's assistant since 1979 until he retired two years ago. And then uh, Amy was the uh, hygienist. And then my, my mom, when she, would, when she would be there. And your mom controlled the checkbook? Yeah, she, she handled that stuff. Who did all the billing for the practice? Um, my mom and Erica okay. did the billing. How many dentists were in the practice? Just one dentist, just my dad. Did there come a time when you bought the practice from your dad? Yeah, my, my dad was gonna sell the practice and I, I thought it would be a good idea for, for me to buy it. And I thought maybe I'd run it and it would be something that I so thank you so much, We the People, for the super sticker. I appreciate it. I appreciate the super sticker very much. Okay, back to this. I would, that I would always have, but I didn't, I didn't like the idea of it being sold. Um, so I, I bought it from my dad uh, when he wanted to slow down in 2012. During the time period of 2014, who owned the practice? In 14, I, I was the owner of the practice. Okay. Now, during the time frame of the wires in 2016, who owned the practice? 
I had, I had sold it back to my dad in, two, in 2015. Why did you sell it back to your dad? Because I, I didn't have any time to run it. And even though I bought it, nothing had changed. My dad was still the same dentist that was there. My mom was still the same person doing the books and they were spending all their time running it. And I, I was so busy with my traveling periodontics. Uh, I didn't have time to dedicate to it and it, it really wasn't financially, it, was, it wasn't feasible. And it wasn't, there wasn't a benefit. I want to talk about um, cash a little bit. Um, do you like to collect cash? I always have. Yes. Why? I just, I like, <coughs> it probably goes back to when I was a kid. I mean, I, I get a dollar a week allowance and I would save it up. And I just like the feeling of, of looking at it. I'd rather look at it than put it in the bank. So whenever I had cash, I always saved it up. Right. Charlie Adelson's one true love, money. I just like to look at it. I remember when I was a little boy and I would get a dollar. That was my first love. And then eventually I fell in love with the $5 bill and then the $10 bill and eventually the, the $100 bills. And then, and then I got in the habit, I realized that it really was the best way to respect the money is by stapling it together counting it, becoming more involved with it. Now, uh, were there several ways that you accumulated cash? Yes, there was. Did you have a real estate business, uh, or, or some real estate in 2014? 14, yes. Okay. And, uh, would you accumulate cash through this business? There, were, there was some cash that came in through that, yes. Um, did you rent out dock space behind your house? Yeah, I, I rented out my dock space behind my house since 2006, and it's been rented ever since. Same, and how would person. you be paid for that dock space? Um, the guy would come down uh, once a year, and he would pay me in cash for the year. Were there other ways that you would accumulate cash over the years? From from whatever I did uh, work on. Yeah, all my illegal businesses, my selling of steroids, the, the illegal racket I had going with Ryan. If you've been watching my live streams or you, you subscribe to Murder by Maestro, that channel, highly recommend you subscribe to his channel. My wonderful mod moderator, he's working on a dynamite new new video. Can't wait till that comes out for you guys to see it about Wendy and her past working with victims of trafficking. So yeah, just, I just lost my totally lost what I was going to <laughs> say here. I got off on murder by Meister, but he had a million. Oh, now I remember. He had a million illegal, just illegal businesses going on the side. And it seemed like part of it was, was they were all suing each other, buying each other's businesses. I have no idea. Someone would have to explain it to me how all these scams work. I just learned how the payout worked where Ryan Fitz, Fitzgerald's scheme, what it seemed like, what they were doing was buying people's civil lawsuits when, and before they were, they were buying the lawsuit and paying them out before the insurance company paid off. So like slip and fall kind of thing, civil suits. They were big into that. So yeah, he had a, he had a million things going someone as a favor and they were just paying me for the materials. I got paid in cash on that. Um, and probably the, the biggest source of cash through the years is every time I went out, every chance. Did he just mention the materials again? So he's like, I, if you, if you missed it, I was giving free dental care to other dentists because they would want to come to me of all the dentists they knew they would want to come to me to have their dental work done. And I would get paid for the materials. Like, let's just hear that one more time, just really quickly. 
Um, and probably the, the biggest source of cash through the years is every time I went out, every chance I could, I used my credit card to build up the airline miles and I'd always pay the tab and whoever was there would just give me the cash and it, it added up over the years. I've done that 20 years. And it added up, always paying the moms a favor and they were just paying me for the materials. I got paid in cash on that. Um, and there you go. See, he got paid for the materials and now his airline miles. And he was talking to Donna about the same thing. How many air miles I have and how he won't travel now. I'm sure that Ruth Markell and Phil Markell and Shelly Markell all wish that they could trade in all the air miles for the rest of their life and never go anywhere for having Dan, Dan Markell back. And here he is complaining about his air miles that he's lost on jailhouse calls. It was ridiculous. And probably the, the biggest source of cash through the years is every time I went out, every chance I could, I used my credit card to build up the airline miles and I'd always pay the tab and whoever was there would just give me the cash and it, it added up over the years. I've done that 20 years. Over and years. once you had this cash, what would you do with it? Whenever I had a thousand dollars, I would have staple it and it was a packet. So I, and it was really, I stapled it because I was just being saved. I wasn't, I wasn't spending it. And I was always using my credit card. So the cash built up. Where would you put the cash? I put it in my safe. When you, st I'm going to go back to your business a little bit. When you started your business, did you make a lot of money the first couple of years? No, no. I mean, I, I, it took off pretty quick, but it, it wasn't, wasn't where it was in 13, 14, or 15. By 2011, uh, approximately, how much money were you making? I was probably making 350 a year. And what did your income look like in the 2014 range? 14. I made between, I think around 850 to 900,000. What were your best years financially? Uh, 13, 14 and 15. Have you ever been married? No. In the time frame of 2013, 14. So isn't he supporting the state's theory there that after the bump, his his psyche fell apart and his life fell apart and he was a nervous wreck and couldn't really work very, very well. He was so irritable and paranoid going for walks. According to June, you guys remember that testimony? No, that was a little later, but still Certainly that testimony of his best years were 13, 14, and 15. Did you have any kids? Back then I didn't have my son. During this 2013, 2014 time frame, how would you succinctly describe your lifestyle? Work came first. I, you know, worked my whole life to get to where I was. So I, um, I wasn't turning any work down. And I was single, so I, I worked. Um, I'd go to the gym late at night, and I'd probably go out one night a week, usually on a Saturday night is when I'd go out. And sometimes I would plan murders with my family. I had that, too, going on. That was a side, side hobby. Now, do you have any children now? Yeah, I've got one son. How old? Five. I want to talk to you about your relationship with your parents as an adult. Fair to say you're close with your mom and dad? Yes. As yes, we're very close. We're very close, Charlie. Very, very close. As an adult, <laughs> how often would you talk with your mom and dad? I would talk to my mom more often. A lot more often just because my dad was always working. Um, but I, I talk to my mom every day.
That's right. Every day. And we talk 35 hours right after your, your jailhouse calls. 35 hours just of straight talking, mostly Charlie talking and Donna just chiming in and affirming everything he's saying. Oh, you're right, Charlie. Oh, you're right. You're right. It was horrible. The jury was horrible. Everybody was horrible. Georgia Kappelman dumbed down facts. There was no evidence. There was no evidence. No evidence in this trial. Georgia Kappelman just presented her no evidence and the dumb jury just voted to convict. Once a day or, or multiple times? Um, at least once a day, but mo most likely probably twice a day because there was always usually one thing was a personal thing and one thing was a, something having to do with the office or scheduling or something, something like that. During the 2014 timeframe when you. All right. Thank you very much. Sherry Davis, Roberta, you crack me up. So glad I crack you up, Sherry. This is a crazy family, right? Don't you feel that way? I mean, when have we ever seen a case like this? Ever. Try never. An entire family, in my view, conspire. I mean, entire family minus Robert, the eldest, who was intensely interested in who murdered Dan Markell. The rest of the family weren't interested at all. In fact, all took the fifth. I was just looking at a legal filing where Donna and Harvey said, if you call me in in Charlie's trial, we're going to take the fifth and we would, we're going to have no mention. Everybody's agreeing that there will be no mention of Donna and Harvey taking the fifth in uh, this trial. So it would have been just an exercise in futility calling them to the stand. It would have been great, though. Even if they took the fifth, it would have been great having them up there. You own the office. Did your mom work for you? You can say that. Yeah. Did, did she control the books? She she wrote the checks. Yeah, she, they had the checkbook in the house. Now, um, was there any particular time that you would talk to your mom more often than other times yeah in, in the morning driving into work i'd call my mom and usually on the way home from work i'd, I'd call them just depends on how long the drive was is really how involved was your mom in your life um business wise very involved because she was running the office um personal wise um i mean i would tell them things and keep them up to date with stuff and my life yeah, when we were planning murder, when we were planning murder, Donna was very involved, very involved with the murder. And just hearing about my day to day life, she was very involved. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how helpful this testimony is because that's where my mind goes. I don't know about yours. It goes right to him plotting with Donna about murder. Murder. But I, it was my life. I mean, I, I did whatever I wanted to do. We're going to get to this later, but how involved was your mom in your sister's life? Um, she was, I think she was more involved. And I, I think my sister involved my mom maybe more. I, and it just depends on different issues. I want to talk a little bit about your sister, Wendy. As adults, before she married Professor Markell, how often would you talk with her? I'd call my sister, I'd say about every 10 days or so we'd talk. I'd call her, but she was real she was busy and she wasn't really good with the phone. So and she I would I would call her and she would always take a day or two to call me back. I spoke to her half the time when I called, half the time she didn't pick up. How often would you see her? Um, again, pre-marriage, how, how often would you see your sister? Um, not a lot. I, in 1995, I left to go to college. In 97, she left to go to college up in Boston. So it was pretty much 
I would say holidays, like every three, four months, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas time, sometimes during the summer. So maybe three, four times a year us here. There came a time when Wendy started dating Professor Markell, right? Yes. Do you remember when you first met him? Uh, I do. I, I think he was in town and I remember all of us going out to lunch. I think we went to a deli. What did you think of him? Um, I thought he was a nice guy. I mean, he kind of seemed like all my other sister's boyfriends she's had in the past. I've never really had much in common with them. Um, and she kind of, kind of seemed like the rest of them, but I, I, that was pretty much it. Well, that's a ringing endorsement. You know, I've been going through these victim impact letters and it's strange. Nobody says Dan Markell was just like the rest of them. Anyone who loved him. What they give you a picture of is how everybody saw the same person enthusiastic, great friend, smart, intellectually involved, enthusiastic, very interested in people, committed to his religion. And here, Charlie is, who has no real interest besides acquiring money and stuff. And I would put his job for the same, in the same category. And his family, the same kind of worldview. How much can we get? And doesn't seem to care at all about other people. Is saying that Dan Markell is so forgettable and so like the rest. Give me a break. Now, after they got married, what was your relationship with what was your relationship like with Professor Markell? Um, it was the same as before they got married. I mean, I didn't we texted each other on our birthdays. Um, I don't think we ever really called each other or hung out. I mean, I would just see him when he came over to the house with, with my sister. And how often would you see him and your sister? I would say twice a year, maybe, or roughly around there, maybe three times a year. In the years that Professor Markell and your sister were married and living in Tallahassee, how often did you come to Tallahassee? I'd only been to Tallahassee. I was there twice, I believe, when her children were born. Um, and then once when I was working in Alabama at a research fellowship and I uh, was passing through Tallahassee, I spent the night with them and I, I saw them that time too. When Professor uh, Markell and your sister were married, did you still communicate with your sister about the same amount of time? It may have been a, a little less because I remember when she had kids, I mean, she had even less time. So I, I probably spoke to her. I'd call her and then probably more times than not, she didn't pick up the phone. And then I'd get a call back a couple of days later. So it was pretty similar. Did there come a time when you became aware that Wendy and Professor Markell were having marital issues? Yes. What did you learn? Um, I took my sister out to dinner when she had come to town and, uh, and we went to the melting pot. And I remember her telling me that they were having issues and it was pretty serious. Did she tell you that they were going through marriage counseling? Yeah. She, that's, that's when I found out. And I guess that's what I was going to say is like, if you tried to work things out and that's when I found out that they, they had been in counseling for six months, I didn't know about it before. Now, what were some of the issues, if you remember that she told you they were having? Um, he, he was becoming very, very religious. Uh, there was becoming issues with diet and how she was cooking in the house. Um, she wasn't really respectful of, of, he wasn't really respectful of her career. Um, he would belittle her. Um, she was, he obviously lost, seemed like he'd lost his eye for her and she seemed like she'd lost his eye for him and she wasn't happy. No. Right. That's why he begged her to reconsider. Even according to Wendy, after she left him in the way that she left him 
to quote DeCoste, Chris DeCoste, McBonawa's lawyer, after Wendy dropped the bomb on him when he was in New York City on business. She took the furnishings out of the house, took the boys out of the house, took the boys' stuff, just left stuff they had outgrown, and left the divorce papers there. What a way to get divorced. And he took the first flight home, begged her to reconsider. And Wendy's answer was so smug, was like, well, he, after I told him repeatedly in couples counseling that I wanted a divorce, that I divorced him, yes. Well, the fact that you're still coming back to couples counseling gives maybe gives him the idea that you're still committed to working it out, Wendy. Oh, it's so frustrating, this bunch. Now, did she complain about violence or danger or anything like that? Never. Did she complain that he was not a good father? No, no, he was very attentive to his sons. Did you learn at some point that your sister was going to file for divorce? I did. And when you heard that she was going to file for divorce, how did you feel? I felt bad for her. I mean, she was sad. I mean, no one goes to get married to get divorced. Um, but she seemed like she spent six months in, in therapy with him and it didn't, it didn't change anything how she felt and he didn't change how he was. Um, and I said, listen, I said, you, the kids need to grow up in a happy household. Like they can't have fighting. They can't have a miserable mom. who's unhappy. Um, you need to have the, the kids are better off growing up in two separate households where there's positive environment instead of negative. Did your sister seem angry to you? No, she, she seemed sad. How involved were you with the divorce proceedings? Because nothing says sad like the way in which she left Dan Markell. No, look at Queen Georgia's face. She's so disgusting by this display. <laughs> That's what it looks like. This ridiculous display of arrogance and lies, just one lie after another. And we don't know half the things that he's saying because we, we couldn't know a lot of this stuff. But we know that Wendy didn't feel sad. She felt angry. How do we know she felt angry? Well, the way in which she left Dan Markell. No one's sad about the divorce or sensitive to another one's their husband's feelings does that. And as for becoming more religious, he wanted kosher food at the wedding. And in interviewing Ruth Markell, I learned that Dan Markell became much more committed to his faith as the marriage went on. And I, I and Already they have problems with cooking kosher. She knows what cooking kosher is. She found him on J-Date. You would have to think that perhaps if you're on J-Date that you might meet someone who will want to keep kosher or would want kosher food at the wedding. But what did the Adelsons do right away? Bam, this is the way it's going to be. You're going to get rid of that silly kosher thing right away because it's our way or the highway. You'll see how stupid it is. How disrespectful right off the, right from the beginning, excuse me, to start it off like that, to start a war. And Wendy saying she had to cook differently. And for Wendy's answer again was so smug. Well, he's kosher, but the family isn't. So it's Dan Markell against the family, very much like what Donna was trying to do, was saying your father's stupid to, the, to her grandchildren. 
he's going to take my sunshines away. So starting a kind of us versus them mentality towards Dan Markell, the kind of cult-like thinking the family already had. We're the Adelsons. We're the, we're like royalty. Everyone who's not an Adelson is not important. It's like a very, very dangerous mindset. I, I wasn't really involved with the divorce proceedings um, on the day-to-day -day stuff. I, I would definitely hear stories, uh, most of which would come from my mom uh, when I'd be driving to work in the morning or driving home. I would, I would hear the latest update of what's going on. But I would say probably... 20% came from Wendy and 80% came from my mom. How did uh, Wendy seem to you during the period uh, when they were going through the divorce proceedings? Extremely stressed, very stressed out. Um, how did your mom seem? Uh, she, she was upset because my sister was, was stressed and it was almost like a telephone game. Like my, my sister would vent to my mom, then my mom would be venting to me. And how does your lawyer seem right now? Extremely nervous, very stiff, shifting his weight from foot to foot, nervously turning the pages as if they are going to disintegrate as he turns them, <laughs> worried that something arrogant and unappealing will come out of my mouth any second. Isn't that what it seems like? In general, was your perception that the litigation was very litigious? Yeah, I, I did. I did learn that. I mean, he was fighting over bicycles and all kinds of nonsense, and it seemed not to end. Now, were there some big issues like relocation that were issues as well? Yes. Let's talk about relocation. Did there come a time that you learned that your sister filed a motion to try to relocate to South Florida? I did. And do you know why she wanted to relocate to South Florida? Uh, primarily, it was because she had no family in Tallahassee. And she had two young kids. And my parents lived in South Florida. I, I, lived, in, I lived in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and she wanted to be closer to family. And she had a, a better, more secure job for her career in South Florida. How did you feel about the idea of your sister and the boys moving to South Florida? I thought it would be great. I mean, I, I hadn't lived in the same town as her since 1995. Um, so I thought it'd be great to have her, have her in town. How important was it to you? I mean, it, it wasn't real important to the point where like I, I thought about it all the time, but I mean, if I thought about it, I'd be happy to have her back home. How important was it to your mom and your dad? Oh, to them, it was very important. <laughs> right. Not important to Charlie. It wasn't that I thought about it every minute of every day of every second. So another admission in the negative there. And of course, it was very important, very important to Donna, very I think we need to take a little break. I need a little palate cleanse. I don't know about you. It's a lot of Charlie. And I get this way, but I watch a whole lot of him. He's so repellent. But let's take a little break. And what should we watch? Maybe. Let's see. How about this one? Great one for murder. Murder by Maestro. I know you already testified about this, but but does an innocent person say if they had any evidence? Right. Katie, Katie's saying it's the police, and I'm saying that we're innocent. They're not going to have any evidence to show we were part of something that we were part of. If we had any part of this, we'd be going to the airport right now. And I Isn't still it say true, the Doctor, thing. that they're not going to have any evidence because you were careful? No, because we weren't a part of this. You were smart. No, we weren't a part of this. 
You walled yourself off from I was the killers. sure they're not going to have evidence to show I did something I didn't do. So we're not running to the airport. You're untouchable, right? No. Donna Adelson was arrested right here at Miami International Airport on the jetway as she was getting ready to board a one-way flight to Vietnam. That's a country without extradition to the United States. Now she's in custody in Miami, waiting to be transferred to Tallahassee. I'm sorry, RIP your ears. I hear it was quite loud. I don't actually have control over uh, videos that I think maybe, I think maybe in the future, I think there's maybe a way I can turn it down, but it's a little bit more involved and probably the video would have been over by the time I did it. So I won't do that to you again next time, guys. Sorry about that. Back to Charlie Adelson's testimony. I just needed a little palate cleanse. If you still have ears left <laughs> to hear after that. They wanted her to come back because she had no family in Tallahassee. And what was your understanding of what Professor Markell thought about this relocation effort? I knew he was against it and he, he wanted her to stay in Tallahassee with him. Did you learn at some point that the petition was denied for relocation? Yeah. And when it was denied, um, how did your mom feel about it? My mom was, they were very disappointed. They were, uh, they were unhappy. How about your sister? She wasn't that disappointed, I guess, because she's a lawyer and she knows, you know, what, what's the probability of something like this happening. And she, she said it was a long shot. She said she wasn't really expecting it, but it was, it was worth it just to take a shot to see if it would happen. Were you angry? No, I mean, it didn't change anything in my life. Now we've seen some emails regarding converting the boys to Christianity. We've seen, um, Oh, now they're talking about Donna's emails, but seriously, listen to this part. This is very interesting here. Take a listen to this part. Open up your ears. I know it all sounds so mundane and, and like one lie after another, which it is, but this is a particularly interesting part right here. Some pretty out there emails from your mom. Do you recall seeing those emails in this trial? I do, yeah. And do you recall whether you saw those emails when they were written back when they were written? Yeah, I, I would get forwarded me all kinds of stuff for sure. Did you come up with any of those ideas? No. Now, on some of those emails, we'll see that you respond, I like it. Why did you respond that way? Well, my, my sister tried being really nice to Danny. It, it got her nowhere. And he was being really litigious. And he was looking to give her a hard time. And I thought that this would... I thought it was a way that she would go ahead and give him a hard time back and kind of push his buttons the way he was trying to push her buttons. So basically, you know, if he's being a jerk to you, just be a jerk back and see if maybe he'll stop. So I, I didn't think any of those things she was actually ever going to follow through with, you know, but I, I thought that it would really push his buttons. So I, I thought, why not give it a shot? There's, there's the real Charlie Adelson right there, right there. So he knows he's totally locked in because they already have the text messages saying, I like it. I like the idea of you dressing up the kids in Hitler youth uniforms. I like the idea of enrolling them in Bible study classes, getting them baptized and taunting Dan, Dan Markell with it. So the only thing he can do is say, yeah, I was fully on board with this. I didn't think she was going to do it, of course, but I thought it was a great idea. But he, he, this will show you the problem with his whole defense. He's boxed in already with the evidence, and he can only tailor his story to the evidence. That's the best story he can come up with. Because 
I mean, barring saying he was saying I like something else that they were talking about and doing the favorite Adelson defense, right? It was taken out of context. The context is all there. There's no context to I like it. After she's presenting the idea to Charlie Adelson. So he's, that's him. He's already revealed himself to the jury. I was fully on board with that. Push his buttons, give him a hard time, punish him, force his hand, make him do what you want to do. And so for a jury, a jury's looking at that saying, yeah, someone who would be on board with that is more likely to do more, even more extreme measures to get their way. Like, uh, Murder, right? Murder. So it's it's really a very, very bad fact that he's got to admit there. And he's not charming enough, sorry, Donna, to sell it fully. He looks like a vengeful, intensely involved brother who is fully on board with extreme measures to problems that are pretty every day. What is the divorce rate in America? It's already, I think it's like 50%. Last I checked, at least, maybe even higher now. So a lot of people go through divorces. A lot of people go through nasty divorces. This has got to be the first time you ever heard about a Jewish family suggesting dress up your kids in Hitler youth outfits. And to my mind, it really denotes a lot of self-hate. Now, I want to talk about the million dollar offer. Did you ever become aware of efforts by your family, including yourself, to offer Professor Markel money to allow your sister to relocate? I did. Yes. And do you recall who came up with that idea? It was my parents. What was the, what were the terms of the offer? How much was it for? The offer was, uh, for $1 million to, to have him move down South to South Florida with my sister and the boys. And that would afford him enough money that he could easily commute to his job in Tallahassee the days that he worked, uh, just the way senators in South Florida commute to Tallahassee all the time. And that was the idea behind it. Now, how were you involved in this idea? Not super involved, but I I definitely said to my parents, I said, I will, I will help and I will pay a third of that million dollars. And when Wendy one day starts making real money, um, you know, she's able to, I want to be paid back. So Wendy wasn't making real money yet. That's not real money. So dismissive, right? And just making himself look bigger. Yeah, I was willing to throw her some of my money, quarter, right, a third of a million dollars. That's nothing because I was making real money. Wendy wasn't. And when I mean self-hatred, I mean self-hatred around their religion. I don't know another... Jewish person who would dress up their kids in Hitler youth outfits for any reason. It's just like he can't help himself. The arrogance will always seep out the sides with this guy. At this point in time, were you making more money than your parents? I was, yes. Did you or your family ever speak with an attorney about the legality of this offer? I didn't, but I know they they wanted to run it by uh, an attorney. I think they used Gary Cohn to uh, to run it by. Do you know if the offer was ever made? I as I sit here today. I know that the offer was never made, but back when the offer I thought was made, 
I thought it was made and it thought it was turned down. Did you, Charlie, you like to talk a lot, right? Yeah. I, I didn't realize how much I talk until I listened to all those tapes. And uh, evidently I do. I mean, I, I knew I liked to talk, but didn't realize how much. When you got like to talk is an under estimate there. How about, how about talk endlessly about yourself with no concern for the other party on the line in circles, going over the same subject matter again and again and again. You all remember how excited we are. We were when the jailhouse calls came out, we were like, Oh, this is going to be juicy. And yes, yeah, some of it was, but you know what the juicy parts were when Charlie wasn't on the line or when Donna thought he wasn't on the line, the line wasn't completely dropped. It was just like a little hand, like the hand of God coming in and intervening in this case and getting Donna on the line saying, I want Wendy to, to look and talk to us about non-extradition countries as a lawyer, as a lawyer who doesn't talk. I love that part. It's just, to my mind, denotes such paranoia. Such paranoia. I want her to look at all this stuff. I want her to look at all the stuff that she planned, right? That's when it got juicy. But the rest of what Charlie has to say, sure, it's a little interesting. Him talking about the jury so dismissively talking about how they're inbred in Tallahassee and his close relationship with Josh Dubin. That was very interesting. And he seemed to pick up all the same talking points of the movement of which Josh Dubin comes from. No evidence. They presented no evidence. The prosecution, the prosecutors only out for themselves, only out to make a name for themselves. I couldn't have a fair trial. It wasn't moved in that town. All the same stuff. Tunnel vision investigation. They couldn't understand that all these coincidences weren't me, weren't our family. The family that everyone, including Wendy, and boy, did Wendy fight testifying. What a lie that was that she was just given immunity. It comes with the subpoena. Immunity just comes with the subpoena. She was threatening the same way Harvey and Donna were. We're going to take the fifth. That's how she was subpoenaed to testify. It was like a lot of back and forth. And I bet it was agreed that, that Georgia Kappelman couldn't talk about it the same way she couldn't talk about Harvey and Donna taking the fifth or threatening to take the fifth should they be called in Charlie's trial. So, yeah. Got involved in this million dollar offer. Would you talk about it with others? Yes. How would it come up? It would come up when people would say, you know, doesn't your sister want to move back? back home you know how's she doing and i said yeah no she definitely wants to move back home we tried everything we could like we even offered a million dollars to uh to dan to see if he would move down with her and uh and it didn't work like we turned it down now did you ever talk with katherine magbanawa and we'll talk a lot about her in a little bit but did you ever talk with katherine magbanawa about that million dollar offer Yes, I did. And what do you remember telling her? The same thing I told everybody else is it came up when my she was asking me about, you know, doesn't your sister want to move back home? And I said, yeah, I said, you know, we tried everything we could. We even offered Danny a million dollars to move back to South Florida. And, uh, and it didn't work. And the same thing I said to her is what I said to a bunch of people. How did she respond? She, she was like, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. She's like, you, you got to take out a loan for that. And I said, no, I, I got cash. I can pay for it. 
Now let's talk about um, gifts to your sister during her divorce. Let's talk about Charlie Adelson's arrogance, because isn't this the thing that brings the Adelson family down, their own arrogance? So it's not that they're so optimistic. It's really that they're so arrogant. And I believe that they thought we are so much smarter than everyone else. No one's going to figure this out. No one's going to figure out the TV alibi. Nobody's going to figure out the Jeffrey Lacoste Patsy plan. And that's another moment in this case where it's like the hand of God just came down <laughs> and had Jeffrey Lacoste leave the night before. Because had he left that day, he would be screaming like a madman and he would have been suspect number one for at least long enough for the Adelson family to get out of town. By then, too late. That's what they thought. But wasn't the plan always that if Luis Rivera, Luis Rivera decides to talk, if Sigfredo Garcia decides to talk, if, heaven forbid, Katie McBanawa decides to talk. It's going to be their word, these uneducated, poor people. One's a Latin king. They're going to believe a Latin king. And Katie McBanawa, who lives in the same, comes from the same neighborhood as the Latin kings, they're going to believe them over our word, our well connected, wealthy word. And I'm not sure I got asked a question about how the money to bribe Dan Markell was Wendy's part. What I my understanding is that they paid a, a, a little over a hundred thousand dollars to get this done. Is that right? So the, now we're talking in the millions here for Dan Markell. So I'm not sure what the connection is there but maybe I don't really understand where you're going. Let me know where you're going with that. In general, did you provide any financial assistance to Wendy during the divorce? No, she, she never asked and I, I never gave her any money. Did you pay for her lawyers? Never. Now, did you give her any gifts? And, and let's just start with the broad question and then we'll break it down. Did yes. You give her any gifts? Yes, I, I've given her gifts. To, yes. Okay. Do you recall giving her a TV? Yes. How did that come about? Well, when when she was moving out of the marital home, uh, and she was starting, you know, from scratch in a new house, she didn't take any. Of the, it only took her belongings. Um. I said to my mom, I said, "What does Wendy need? Like, what does she need for the new place?" And she said, "Actually, she's." She's uh, leaving the TV sets. She needs a TV set for the for the house. So I said, "All right, fine." I said, "Go to you know, go to the store up there, and go to Best Buy, and pick out a really nice TV set, and I'll I'll pay for it." I said, "Buy it, and I'll give you the money." But wasn't this TV set Jeffrey Lacoste describes as not a very nice TV set, the kind you find in a dorm room? So where the story is believable is I believe that a brother would buy a sister a TV. But there is a problem that it's Donna's name, not his name on the TV. And Donna, of course, she needs to be in communication because she needs to give Wendy the text message that the geek squad, quote unquote, big quotes, is on their way, meaning Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia are on their way to Danny. It's so dark and so disgusting. But that was the plan, I believe. And where it falls apart is the kind of TV that they got. So this family is so materialistic that they couldn't bust up a really expensive TV that might have cost $5,000 back in 2014 or 2013. They have to buy a cheap dorm room TV because they know Wendy's going to take a hammer to it. Of course, blames it on the children, but Jeffrey Lacoste is looking at the damage to the TV going, 
really looks like someone just went up to it and took a sharp object to it. Don't think he said hammer, but just sharp object to it. Who would do that? The boys? He's like, don't think so. So it's their own greed that that puts a little kink in that plan. Now, do you recall making a joke kink. <laughs> kink, kink. that buying her a TV was cheaper than hiring a hitman? Something to that effect. Yeah, it, it was a moment to say what I thought. Yeah, yeah, tell me I mean, what the joke what was. I, what happened was like when I gave her the TV set as a divorce present, I stupid the stupidest thing I ever said in my life. And I said, I, you know, I, I was going to get you a hitman, but the, the, cheap, the TV set was a lot cheaper, so I went with the TV set instead. And I, I said it as a complete joke, and it was stupid, but I do that a lot. Did you make that joke? All right. So I'm looking for anyone in the audience who has ever – I know I said this last time, but I'm still looking. There might be some new people, different people in the audience. If anyone has ever made the joke that both Charlie and Donna say is so common, which is, I was going to buy you this. It doesn't have to be a TV. I bought, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm presenting the joke wrong. Excuse me. I bought you this blank because it was cheaper than hiring a hitman. To anyone ever in their life, please write me my, email me. My email is in the description of my YouTube channel. Always, it's public. Or just let me know in the chat. Just at, at Roberta Glass, me. <laughs> That's my handle. Just write me. I'll, I'll make a note of it. And uh, I think we should know if, if one, one, one or two people out of all the people who've listened to this episode have ever made that joke. It's not a scientific study, but I'd just like to know since they say it's so common. To others. Yes. Did you make that joke many times throughout 2013 and 2014? I made, I made that joke when she was having problems and she was fighting and she was upset. I, I recycled the joke and it was stupid. Did you ever say that joke to Catherine McBano? Yes, I did. Just, just to be clear, did you ever look into hiring a hitman? No, never. Oh my, we have a winner already. So Lisa's saying they are right. <clears throat> Lisa says she has said it. In what context? Hold on one second. Let me find your comment. Way behind here. You say it was only a joke. Was it in the context of a divorce? Let me know. Okay, so we have one person. Interesting. Good. So maybe it is more common than I think. But nobody ended up dead, I think. There wasn't a hitman who came the next <laughs> the next day. Actually, I think it was Wendy who said she told it that day, no? She told it that day to the repairman, to the geek squad. So what is this obsession with telling the joke? And my theory on it is that the idea was it was a, just a really bad coincidence, something that Wendy could feel badly about as she sat talking to the police. It would make her look innocent. Remember when Jeff Lacoste gets brought in? And he said that And he says, oh, I'm surprised you haven't brought me in earlier because I said half a dozen times I wanted to kick Dan Markell's 
ass. You remember that? Remember how in, how relaxed you got when he said that? Like, oh, of course he wouldn't admit that if he were involved. I really think the point of that was that just that basic, that basic idea. Of course, Wendy wouldn't have told that joke had she had anything to do with it, and then she wouldn't have told the police had she had anything to do with it. And I, I think that I've heard that there was a Matlock episode where someone used a TV as an alibi. I believe that's where Donna got the idea, but I haven't looked deep into it. So forgive me. But they are not an imaginative family. They're an intense family. Excuse me. Had to cough. But. I believe they plan this intensely down to even that joke. And who would do that? Someone who really didn't want to get caught. I believe they thought they would never get caught. And even though we know that Rashbaum had warned Donna that they might stop both of them, Donna and Harvey, I believe Donna used the word stop, not arrest. I don't know if she thought she was going to get arrested. Like, sorry, you can't leave the country. There's no flying for you. Go back home. And then maybe her arrest, but I don't think she thought she was going to get arrested right then and there. And I'd love to know what's on her phone. That's the million dollar question now. Are you aware that the divorce proceedings settled in July of 2013? Yeah, it, it, I believe it ended in summer of 13. Now, how did your sister react to the settlement? I think she. So Lisa says it was years ago. Marriage was in a hard spot, but my husband is still alive and I love him more and more. Oh, that's good, Lisa. Number seven, thanks for sharing. It really was a joke, but I never would have done that right. I would have, it's a horrible thing to say. Remember, Wendy, it's a horrible thing to say. Then she can break down into tears and feel fake guilty. She found it as like a sense of relief. It seemed like she like had closure. She knew, knew what she was going to be doing and where she was going to be living. And she, uh, I think she was just looking, she, I think she was happy. Happy in the sense that she was able to put it behind her. What was the custody arrangement? Do you knew, do you know what the custody arrangement was? I know it was 50 50. After the settlement, how were things with Professor Markel and your sister? Um, I think they were calm for a little bit and then it got litigious. It'd be a little brief areas of calm. And then I think he was try kept trying to bring her back into court and it, it started becoming litigious again. What was your understanding of this mostly based on? Things that I'd hear from my mom, probably 20% from my sister, 80% from my mom. Was your mom upset? She, she would get upset when my sister would, would tell her like, about Danny pushing her buttons and filing all these things in court and giving her a hard time. What about why do they all use that same phrase push buttons? Is that because it's the weakest euphemism? I mean, they're really at war here. And I'm sitting here listening to Charlie Adelson going, why am I so fascinated by this? Why am I so fascinated by this family and it's so dark? And why are we as a culture so fascinated by these people like Robert Durst and Charlie Adelson and Donna Adelson and Wendy Adelson? Antisocial personalities. Because it seems like there's so many of them and they run the world for one. 
And for two, it's so scary. And it's like, if we can understand it, then we at least know what we're dealing with a little bit. If we can understand what we're seeing, because they're so good at, at seeming almost human. It's like they can always imitate it up to a certain point. Come close, but not quite. They always fall short. And it comes out in, in little things. Like Wendy making real money. I always like to look at money. <laughs> That's their true net. That's Charlie Adelson's true nature. And I thought I liked it. Great idea. Dress the kids up in Hitler youth outfits. And it's in the audio recordings of his jailhouse calls. Never a minute, never a second of remorse does his family have. They feel totally justified, like they did the world a favor. They did the boys a favor. How frightening. Because I don't feel that when Donna says Dan Markell is haunting me from the grave, she means that things haven't worked out the way she had planned, meticulously planned. She's disappointed. The stress is not something she anticipated. I bet that's a lot of Pepto-Bismol <laughs> going down her throat, right? This is a family of weak stomachs. We know that, that when they get nervous, you can see it in this trial. Charlie Adelson turns white and almost a shade of a little green at times. Look at him right before the verdict. Can watch that again. He knows what's coming. He reads the jury's face in a second. It's so scary. He knows what's coming. None of them can look him in the eye. He knows what's coming. Then you can see him try to rationalize what he just, what he knows to be true. And when he hears the verdict, he just puts his head down. Can't believe it. All his hard work memorizing all the right answers to these questions. But it's really one of the more frightening cases because they aren't the obvious people that you would pick to be murderers. They, I feel like any one of us could be married into this family and they would have been so nice, right? Up until the wedding. And it's so interesting to me that the minute, the day of the wedding, that's when the first strike hit, the scorpion attacked. No kosher food, something really important for you. It's like not being able to eat at your own wedding and not having anyone that you really care about be able to eat at your own wedding or a good majority of the people that you care about not being able to eat at your own wedding. Something that you paid half for. Disgusting. About you, during the period of all this litigation, what were your feelings about Professor Markell? I, th I thought he was being a jerk. I mean, uh, hearing stories that he's showing up at her work and bad-mouthing her to other colleagues and saying horrible things about her, like, you know, I thought he was just being a jerk to her. Now, would you think about this all day long in the morning and at night? I mean, how, how important was this to your life? It, it wasn't. I mean, I, I would only think about it when I'd be listening to a story and, uh, and it would be, I'd be driving in the car, talking to my mom. She would relay the latest that my sister told her and then she'd be telling me. And that's when I would think about it. But I mean, I never for a second was at work thinking about it or doing activities that I enjoyed thinking about it. When I wake up in the morning, I never thought about it. Were you panicked at all about it? Were you concerned that your sister was going to be disbarred? Anything like that? Was that a big issue for you? No, I mean, that was, 
that was a nonsense threat. Um, when you would learn about things, though, would you talk to them, talk about what was going on to others? Yeah, yeah, I, I did talk a lot. Why would you, considering your sister's divorce wasn't, and her her issues with Professor Markell weren't a huge part of your life, as you've testified, why why would you be talking about it to others? When I talked a lot. How yeah. would it come up? And it would, it would come up when I'd be sitting at the dinner table and I'd hear this crazy story that my mom told me from from earlier that day. And I guess it's more interesting than talking about teeth. So I would, I would sit there and I'd share things with my girlfriend or friends and I'd relay stories. By the way, during this time period, and now I'm talking about late 13, second half of 13 and 14, were you still speaking with your sister about the same amount or, or more? I would say it's probably about the same, but every 10 days or so we talk. Did you travel to Tallahassee to check on her after she filed for divorce? How many times did you come to Tallahassee during this time period? Never. I think the last time I came to Tallahassee was 2011, 2011 or 2010. Now, what? Not for nothing, but is anyone noticing how stiffly Dan Rashbaum is moving? I think someone told him not to move too much at the podium. So when he's moving his arm, he's like the tin man in uniform. Like he can't bend his elbows. Like his arms are like straight. He's just moving so weirdly and robotically at the podium. I can't keep my eyes off it. What was your understanding of how Wendy felt about the idea of staying in Tallahassee um, as time went on? I think she, she understood that's what her, her life was going to be. I mean, she, she loved her job up here. Um, she was getting excited about things. She was dating people. She was, she was embarking on her, her new life in Tallahassee. What was her, um, did there come a time when she won an award and what do you remember about that? I remember I was real proud of her. Uh, she wrote a book. And the book was selected by Florida State to be the mandatory reading for all incoming freshmen. And uh, she was chosen to be the speaker uh, to the incoming class. And that was to take place in August. And I know she was super excited about it. And we're all planning to come up there and be there for her. Okay, I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about Catherine Magbanawa. May I have one moment, Your Honor? Here's the Edelson dry mouth. Yeah, good time for an intermission now. When did you? How did you first meet Catherine Magbano? I met Katie uh, in the summer of 2013. She started working the front desk of a dental office that I worked at. And uh, what was that dental office? Where was it? The name of the office was Sophie Dental, and it was uh, in South Beach. What did she do for the dental office? She was the, the front desk and office manager for the office. Okay, listen to this. This is interesting. Listen to what he likes about Katie McBanoa. How often would you work in that office? I was there, say, every three weeks. I was there for half, what, half a day every three weeks. Was that office a big generator of income for you? Um, it was one of my better offices, yeah. Now, you said you met her in July 2013. When did you first go out with her? We first went out, it would have been uh, 
first week of October, around October 10th. And who initially pursued who? I, I pursued her. Why did you ask her out? Katie was really cute. Um, she was friendly. Um, she went to the same, she actually graduated from UCF also different, different time, but she graduated from there. She was, she was a really smart girl. I mean, she was extremely smart and, uh, and witty and, uh, and that's why I pursued her. Once you went out with her, did you learn that she had two kids? So first thing is that she's good looking. Second thing is that she's friendly. And then he knows he has to start making stuff up. So then he's like, um, we went to the same school. Then she's really smart. She's really witty. Th those things come way down the line after cute and friendly. Friendly is a key. <laughs> Meaning she listened to my, my long, boring stories, my talking. That's, I think that's what friendly means without... <laughs> being just repelled like a normal person I thought that was so funny I did <laughs> now initially did you learn anything about her ex-husband no I the only thing I knew is that she'd been with somebody for about 10 years uh, and that she was now single after <laughs> the chat she liked his blinking problem really smart equals two margaritas and it's go time she knows killers <laughs> but she likes his blinking problem she had a thug connection yeah all these things oh yeah yeah that's closer to it i think it's a good time to take a break and be back with you right after this short word. Don't go anywhere. If you are enjoying this episode of My True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Okay, we've been going for about two hours. I think that's about as much Charlie Adelson as anyone can take in one day. I don't know how you feel. Maybe. Well, hold on. I'm, I don't know. Let me know how you're feeling. Dr. Zapp. Thank you so much for the $10. Yeah. Yeah. Me at Blake. I so appreciate it. Dr. Zapp. Dr. Zapp. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So how are you guys feeling? Are you feeling like a little bit more of this or have you had, I think that's, I think they think we've done it for the night. Yeah. You make time fly. Yeah. All right. A little bit more. All right. A little bit more. Okay. All right. We'll watch a little bit more. See how we'll see how much we can. Donna is getting friendly with Ghislaine Maxwell. Same jail. Isn't, no, it can't be, right? Because Maxwell's in prison and Donna's in just jail, jail. It's got to be different sections, right? Let me know what you know about that. I know it's a huge complex, uh, com complex. All right, more back to Charlie Adelson's obnoxious cross. Or if there's something else you'd rather rather watch. Oh, it's in federal. Yeah, it's in federal prison too. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, I covered Maxwell's trial. <clears throat> and sentencing. It was quite amazing. Just the wealth, the amount of wealth. You dated her a couple times. What did you like about her? Well, and aside from the initial things, what attracted me to her was she was she had a very busy life also. And my life was so busy, it was hard for me to be in a, a relationship where someone wanted to go have dinner at five, five o'clock and sit, hang out with me a couple of days a week. So she was, she was working full time, had two kids. So she was fine seeing me once or twice a week. And we, we both had very little time. Now you said that your first date was sometime in early October, 2013. Yeah, it wasn't even a real date. We just went and had dinner. There's a restaurant in the building. We finished late and I said, you want to grab dinner? We ate at the, at the building. Did you ask her just two weeks later if she could find someone to kill Professor Markell? No, not at all. Did you have a Halloween party with her or go trick or treating with her and after the party say, hey, uh, do you know anyone who can take care of my ex brother in law for me? No, absolutely not. See, here's this same defense that you see so often, which is most people imagine someone approaching someone or beginning to approach someone about a murder, a murder in some dark alley or there something really intense happened. But often it's really mundane every day and it seems almost silly oh yeah we're going to talk on halloween after we go to say a costume party or go trick-or-treating it seems so ridiculous on certain but that's how it happens you know anyone who could rough someone else he wasn't talking about murder quite yet that's not what so what they're doing is a straw manning the state's case there and b making an argument to the jury that the state's case is so ridiculous, so unbelievable, no one in their right mind would do that in the beginning of a relationship as someone. But as we know, and as many people have theorized, Charlie Adelson may have, depends on what your point of view is, picked out Katie because of her connections, because of where she came from, because of her baby's daddy, Sig Sigfredo Garcia, and his connections. He knows, we know that Charlie already likes to hang out with people on both sides of the tracks. But he's already given his money once to someone who took off with it, 50K last year, he's not going to have that happen again. He wants someone close to him. How much closer? I was so hoping he'd say when talking about Katie, well, I saw a young lady who really could use one breast, one bigger breast. And I wanted a woman who was self-reliant enough to pay for the other one. <laughs> it was talking about the boob job. I mean, you could not make up the details in this case. Paid for one half, one half of a breast job. Unreal. Now, back to the relationship. Over time, did it become more serious? Over time, you know, in the beginning, it's always like you just trying to see who each other is. And then as time went on, she wanted to get more serious. I'd say probably by the springtime, by probably around March, she started asking me. Now, did you consider her to be your girlfriend though? She was my girlfriend, yeah. Uh, did you consider yourself to be exclusive? After the first three months together, yeah, for sure. Did you ever see a possibility of marriage with her? 
No, I didn't. During the time that you dated her, how often, and let's, let's, let's be clear, we're talking about now the beginning of 2014. So let's keep it far away from July. During the time that you dated her, how often would you communicate with her? We, we talked every day. When would you talk to her? I'd call her when I was in the car driving to, to work. Um, we'd text throughout the day. And, uh, and then I'd always talk to her at night time. Where was she living at the time? She was living in, in North Miami, Miami. And again, you were living in the same place in Fort Lauderdale? Same house in Fort Lauderdale. How often would you see her? I would see her once a week. Sometimes every once in a while it would be twice, but I would say more often once than twice. And when you saw her, what would you typically do? We'd go to dinner, um, hang out, watch a movie, um, hang out at my house. Did you have any relationship with her children? No, I, I met her children on one occasion, May, maybe twice, but definitely no more than twice. Did she go to family events with you? Um, she did meet my family a couple of times, yeah. She met your sister how many times, if you recall? Two times. And she was a very adorable girl, that Katie. We met her. When we were planning our murder, she came over the house. We had, we, what do we have? We had tea and cookies and banana bread, my famous banana bread. And then we talked about murder, murder together. That's what all good families do. <laughs> and how to get rid of that horrible, horrible Dan Markell. Chippers was being so mean to my Wendy. And she was very good at planning murder. How many times do you think she might have met your parents? I'd say uh, maybe around eight times, eight or nine times. Was she a patient of your dad's? Yes, she was. We're going to get into this in more detail later, but let's be clear right now. Did Catherine Magbanua ever work for your dad or for you at the Adelson Institute? No, never. Now, I think you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but as time went on in 2014, did she want to be more serious? Yeah. And what did you think about that? I, I like the, the way it was. I mean, it was it was good in the beginning. My life, I wasn't looking to change it. I was still in that workaholic mode. Um, but she started asking me, you know, what are we? What are we doing? At the time that you <laughs> met her, and I want to talk a little bit about your knowledge of Secreto Garcia now. At the time that you met her, to your knowledge, she was single, right? Yes. And I think you testified that initially you didn't learn anything about her ex. Nothing other than she was, she was completely single. She was done with him. I want to show you. Defense exhibit, it's not in evidence. So I love that she was totally single and yet he was buying Sigfredo Garcia at the end there. He's buying her, uh, buying him birthday presents. Isn't that believable? birthday presents, he hit it out of the park, buying cruises for Katie and her mom, even though he denies it, offering her stuff left and right after they broken up. I wonder how much stuff he, actually, don't ask what he buys for June now, but 
<laughs> I'm sure not much. I'm sure all their money's going to lawyers, but I wonder how many other ex-girlfriends, and I think that's a question Georgia Kaplman asked Wendy. Can't remember him doing all that stuff for any other ex-girlfriend. All right, let's look at what Dan Rashbaum has in store. Is he moving like the Tin Man or what? Oh, now he's a little less stiff here, but he's like got his arms stretched out on the podium, like yeah, holding on to it for dear yeah, life, right? like he's water skiing or something. I'm showing you what's marked for identification purposes as defense exhibit 34. Okay. Please take a look at it. Are these text messages uh, between you and Catherine Magbanoa on November 27th at 2.13? Yes, they are. Judge, I'd move in Defense Exhibit 34 at this time. Response? Here, say, Your Honor. Please Stand approach. Yes. Now, Pat, you see the, the timing is in military time. So it says November 27th at 1342. We can agree that's 142. Yes. Katie says, my ex knows about you. I'm pretty sure I, I know how he knew because he even knows your name. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you say, do I know him from my past? You see that? Yes, I do. What are you asking Katie here? Um, I have no idea who who her ex is. She's saying he knows me, so I'm I'm saying, does he? Do I know him? And that's in late November, two thousand thirteen, right? Yes. That's after one month, almost after Halloween, correct? Yes. Now, as time went on, did you learn more about her ex? Uh, in the springtime, I did. In February, was there an incident with Katie and her ex that you recall? Yeah. Um, I remember her coming over my house and she was, she was pretty upset. She had a, a mark on her neck. Uh, they'd gotten into an altercation and he ripped a necklace that he'd given her off her neck and she was crying and she was all upset. How did you react? She could tell I, I was upset. I mean, someone just roughed her up and, uh, she could tell I was upset and she said, don't, don't do anything. She goes, he, he will kill you. He, he will kick your ass. He's, you don't stand a chance. Now, why did you continue to date her after this? I didn't take that as a, a threat to me. I just took it as she's got a 
crazy ex-boyfriend that wants her back and she's got two kids with him and it, it wasn't a threat to, it was i didn't feel like he was threatening me she just was like you know it's a it's a part of her life that i, I wasn't going to hold against her i want to show you isn't that nice he's not going to hold it against her when they're plotting a murder, he's not going to look down on her character. Oh. A couple other texts related to your relationship with Miss Magbanawa uh, in February, January, February, and March of 14. These will be defendants exhibits 35 36 and 37. There's so many tips given about Charlie. One that he had blackmailed the guy over his business i don't know if it was blackmail but threatened his business another was that he had dropping he was obviously selling steroids that was caught on the wiretap i believe he had was running all sorts of illegal businesses or in scams with ryan I believe that whole thing was one big scam. That's my opinion. I mean, what a menace. I'm looking at this guy. What a menace. Aside from the this most disgusting, immoral act that can never be undone. What a menace he, he was to society. Really almost like a caricature, like the bad dentist in Little Shop of Horrors. Like absolutely terrifying no no morality zero zero sense of morality huge ego the means to do to do what he wants Rash has got to do some major paper shuffling here. The January text is 35. The February text is 36. And the March 24th text, do you have that one? Is 37. So, do you think Donna was sending Rashbaum text messages throughout this? Like, Rashi, you're doing such a good job. Excellent, excellent work. Not guilty. I can't wait till that not guilty vote comes down. Is that, you think that's what was going on? His phone just like ding, 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 ding throughout this whole examination
Do you recognize these text messages? Yes, I do. Were they kept, are they accurate reflections of your text messages? They are, yes. I would move these exhibits into evidence now, Your Honor. Any objection? You can show me a copy of the exhibits. Yes, Your Honor. Oh my, what is going on with these exhibits? The suspense. Attorneys can briefly approach. Oh boy. Here, so let's talk about um, Defense Exhibit 35. Sure. A text from January 19, 2014. And in this exchange, what is Miss Magbanawa asking you about? She asked me she asked me if I wanted things to be different, and she was saying how much she missed me. And did you want things to be different at this point in time? No, I, I wanted things to stay the way they were from when we just started dating. Now, if you turn to Defense Exhibit 36, text messages from February 5th, 2014. Mm -hmm. What is she asking you? What does she start by asking you about? And you don't have to read it. Just tell the jury generally what she's asking you about. What is she concerned about? She's asking if I'm talking to a bunch of other girls. And... What do you tell her in response generally? I, I say, no, I'm not. And again, in this text message, she's asking you whether she's telling you that she wants more, right? Yeah. And how do you respond? Um, I ask. I ask her, are you thinking about getting back with your ex? And then what do you say after that? Uh, oh, yeah. I say you're the coolest and most fun girl that I'm always happy when I'm around. And then I said, I know it's, it's not easy. And I think we're doing a good job at not rushing things. So, and what were you trying to tell Miss Magdanawa in this text message? I was trying to say, I, I like you and I have a good time hanging out with you, but I don't want to rush things. Now, 
moving to text messages in March of 2014. Ms. McVanawa texts you, you've mentioned me to your mom and you say yes. And she says, I love you. Aw, oh, baby. How did you, why was this a big deal to her? Um, I guess when I'd spoken to her, I brought up that I'd mentioned her to my mom and she thought I was trying to, I was making things more serious. So she, she got, I think she got excited over that. Okay. You can put those aside. Judge, I'm going to object regarding defense exhibit 37 and ask for best evidence for it to come to the jury. I'll sustain on best evidence grounds. Please publish defense 37. Members of the jury get to reach your own conclusions as to the context of the statements. Okay. Yeah, because he was saying, <laughs> I, I mentioned you to my mother because we were talking about murder. Murder. That's why. That's why she got the wrong idea. March 24th at 12.17. Do you see she texts you and says, you've mentioned me to your mom? Yes. Do you see that you respond, yes? Yes, I do. Do you see that she responds, that made me so happy? Yeah, she, she took it the wrong way. Any other clarification, Your Honor? What is Rashbaum doing? Is he testing our eyesight with the, like the smallest possible print ever in these exhibits? <laughs> is this an eye test? And yeah, she got the wrong idea. I just mentioned her as far as the TV, wink, wink. That's why I mentioned her to mom. We were talking about the TV. Is it fair to say that she was excited that you had mentioned her to your mom? Um, yeah, she was, she was happy and she, she got overly excited. I, I wasn't expecting that. Now. So now Charlie Adelson is all puffed up. His ego is all inflated. She was just thrilled at the idea of being with me and maybe one day marrying me. Me, Charlie Adelson, the giant catch. The giant catch who could, couldn't graduate dental school without the help of a Broward County judge because I had failing grades and couldn't graduate on my own. Me, Charlie Adelson the absolutely most self-involved, narcissistic, morally bankrupt piece of nothing that you're ever going to meet. Just dating me would give any girl the butterflies in her stomach. It's the same thing as Wendy when she talks about her eyes being blue, that the clerk in the store where she was buying liquor, said her eyes were so blue or went to cost in the middle of grilling her. Talked about her being wicked smart and being a published author. Now you're just embarrassing me. They had the same smirk, the same look on their face. In the early summer, of 2014, what were you telling your friends about your relationship with Catherine Magbano? Sustain, please lay a foundation if you can. Was your relationship coming to an end in the summer of 2014? Yes, she, she wanted more and I didn't want anything more. And were you communicating that to friends? Yes, I was. I want to talk to you about a dinner on March 11th, 2014, a Yardbird dinner. 
One moment, Your Honor. Take your time. Do you recall going to that dinner? Yes, I do. Do you remember whether you, who was the dinner with? I was. I met Katie uh, down in Miami on Lincoln Road, and uh, my sister was in town, and I I was already working down there. I remember I was in my scrubs, and uh, my sister came and she brought uh, the the guy that she just started dating, who was uh, Jeff Lacoste. Do you recall where you sat? Yeah, we, we sat outside the restaurant. There was a, a few tables set up on the sidewalk, and uh, it was the four of us sitting there. Did you know that you were being watched? No, not at all. Did you know that Sigfredo Garcia was thinking about killing you that night? No, not at all. I think that's news to Sigfredo Garcia, too. <laughs> It was just my sister and myself and the two people we were using. What a family. Now, this is March 11th, 2014, right? Yes. During the dinner, do you recall discussions about ex-husbands between your sister and Catherine Magbanua? Yes, I do. Do you recall who initiated those discussions? No, I don't. Do you recall making a bad joke again at that dinner? Yes. And that's the same joke that we've already discussed. Yeah, I do. Now, after the dinner, who came back to your house? My sister and Jeff Lacoste came back to my house. What about Catherine Magbanua? No, she, she went home <laughs> to be with her kids. And was it a normal night when your sister and Jeff Lacoste came back? Yeah, but it's, it's the first time I've ever had, I think, my sister and her boyfriend sleep over my house. So it was, it was normal. Did you ever have any conversations other than some text messages that Jeff Lacoste sent you with him after that night? No, I never spoke to him again. Did you know anything about a first attempted murder of Professor Markell in early June? No. Now, there's been a lot of talk about birthdays and your dad's birthday and a birthday present. And you may remember some text messages that the state showed during their case regarding wanting to talk to your, give me one second. Do you recall the state showing text messages where you're texting with your mom and she tells you that she can't talk right now, um, that she'll call you when she's alone, she's driving back and she's at a stop in, in Gainesville and to erase the text message? Yeah. Do you recall what that is all about? It was about my dad's birthday. Who was your mom with at that stop at Gainesville? She was with my dad, so she didn't want to talk in front of him. And why didn't she want to talk in front of him? It's so easily explained, guys. They were We were talking about his big birthday present, which was murder. Murder. Well, he doesn't have to say that. He just has to say, it's my birthday present. We were keeping it from Harvey. And then we went out for a big celebration to celebrate the murder. It, it, do, it doesn't refute the state's case at all. 
at all? Because it was a surprise. We, originally, we were thinking about doing a cruise. What was a surprise? That you were going to kill Professor Markell or that you were going to have a surprise birthday party for your dad? No, it was, it was going to be his 70th birthday party. What's we were gonna get them a, a present, but we got we gave Katie and her mom the cruise instead. What's more believable? What's more believable? This this does this refutes the state's case totally, totally. Because you always give your ex girlfriend a cruise, and then her baby daddy birthday presents and cards. And a little something from the wrong side of the tracks. After all the other evidence, of course, this is totally believable. And do you recall in that text message talking about a caterer? Yes. Now, you had discussed this caterer as far back as April and May with your mom, correct? Yes. And those are reflected in text messages as well, correct? Yes, they are. On June 5th, do you recall your mom texting you and asking you don't forget to get information on the caterer. Yes. Now, what did you get your dad for his birthday gift? I paid for the catering for the party. And what type of catering was it? It, was it wasn't kosher. It wasn't kosher catering. Not kosher at all. We had paella. What is the deal with this paella and this catering? It's got to be a double meaning for something else right? Maybe he did pay for the catering, but it's something else. It's some other code word. I'm convinced it has some other meaning, this whole paella obsession thing going on with his family in this dinner. It was uh, a chef came to the party and they cooked paella and seafood. And, uh, and then we had a bunch of desserts also and salads. I'm showing you what's more. We had a kosher style meal, paella. You know, it's kosher style, something you'd find. <laughs> we had Nathan's hot dogs. Then we had paella. And then for dessert, we had some New York style, kosher style cheesecake. It's not confusing at all to anyone who might be kosher, wants to eat kosher. It's so ridiculous. Oh, I think we're near the end here, though. Marked for identification purposes only as Defendant's Exhibit 43. After you it's marked as defendants exhibit 43. And these are after all that trouble from Kate with the co-counsel writing him a note and then Rashbaum just shakes his head and goes on with what he was going to say anyway. I think I've done it for tonight, though, guys, with this. I think I've, I've hit my limit of what I can stand with Charlie Adelson. There's only so much you can stand of this narcissistic, morally bankrupt, horrible person. I think, I'm, I, think I need a palate cleanse. <clears throat> and when I get back, I'll be back with a victim impact letter for Katie McManawas and Sigredo Garcia's trial when 
we get back, meet you on the other side of the break. If you are enjoying this episode of my True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Okay, so to the Honorable, this was written September 15th, 2019. To the Honorable James C. Hankerson, I met Danny in the summer of 2005, the year I graduated law school and moved to D.C. to begin a clerkship. It was a strange time for me, no longer a student, but not really anything else, baffled by aughts, the gnawing need to repay student loans, TikTok, the need to make friends, to find someone, figure out whether this whole law school run had been a waste. A friend from law school, knowing I knew no one in D.C., told me I should meet his friend, Wendy. I did, and I enjoyed her company, but it was Danny who took the lead, seemed determined to get me fitted with a life. He hosted me at their apartment for Shabbat dinner and fed me, introduced me to all sorts of prominent professional contacts and to eligible Jewish men. I was a stranger in a strange land, and Danny knew just how much such a person should be treated by opening his home making them feel cared for. He seemed to believe himself endowed with an outsized set of talents and capacities, and he was. His charge then was to find those in need, share with them what he had. He was the most presumptuously loving person I have ever known. He never asked if you wanted or needed his advice, interest, or love. He just assumed you did. In my case, he wasn't wrong. In the years that I knew him, there seemed to be almost nothing beyond his power. Right out of a law firm, when blogs were just getting going, he started one of the most prominent and powerful, popular, excuse me, for law professors, having only just received an academic post himself. He was a consummate and natural host. A few months after I met Danny, he ran into Zach, an undergrad he mentored while in law school at a wedding. He harassed Zach by phone to get on a plane from Los Angeles and fly to D.C. to take me on a date. The plan was audacious and Danny relentless. It was also just to push Zach. It was also just the push Zach and I needed. More than 13 years and three kids later, I marvel still at the power and reach of Danny's endless capacity for love. But it was a blind spot too, as all strengths are. I have no doubt that what propelled him into marriage so quickly with Wendy was his irrefutable belief that he could fix any problem and answer any challenge, that she didn't seem to share some of his values with regard to religious observance or even what she seemed reluctant to marry him. She broke off their engagement at one point when we were all still in D.C., seemed to him mere kinks to work out, not impediments to a happy married life. On October 9th, 2012, soon after Wendy took the kids and left him, 
He sent his vast number of close friends an email. He told us that he had come home from a work trip to a ransacked house, that Wendy had left and taken the kids, but that he was determined to win her back. He concluded with this. You all know this, I'm sure, but remember, everything wonderful is also and already fragile. Love mightily while you can. It was just like Danny, really, at the bottom of life's umblet, fretting over what he might impart to the rest of us. I called him soon after receiving the email and opened with, just in case it doesn't work out, I've got a girl for you. I thought it would make him laugh, and it did. The irony of my finding Danny someone after he had found someone for me. It just so happened that a friend of mine's sister had recently divorced, but then he started to cry. What's going to become of my boys, he said out loud, more to himself or to God than to me. Their connection to Yeshidic Judaism is already so attenuated. What's going to become of my beautiful magical boys. I assured him that he was still their father and they would be fine. A great dad is a powerful thing even after divorce. He would surely remain a primary influence in their lives. What did I know? All deaths are a loss. But I can't help thinking Danny's measures for greater than most. I'm sorry. I can't help thinking Danny's measures far greater than most. Excuse me. He gave love so generously from such abundant store. He never quit tending his friends, offering his help. Our loss is profound but his boy's loss is infinite. They would have received the lion's share of all that he was and whatever he had, they don't even know. Sincerely, Abigail Schreier. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Have a great Saturday night. Oh, wait, hold on. I have some, su I think I have some super chats. My apologies. Steph, so, so it feels so weird after this, that beautiful letter by Abigail Schreier, who is one of my heroes. Enjoy you so much. Thanks for the laugh. Thanks for the, um, sending me that picture of the dress stuff. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for your super chat. Lady Lex, Roberta and this chat are the best. Oh, thank you, Lady Lee. Have a great night and I will see you back here tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern. Have a good 